Hello everybody, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to another episode here on the series. My name is Dominic and I'm the host of the Android Factory. Last episode we went ahead and implemented these filters here. Uh, as you select them, we filter the list to the corresponding you know, category that these items are a part of. And if you select the one that's already selected, it goes back into the unselected class or, or the unselected state here. So if you missed it, I'll link a card in the top right. Uh, and today we're gonna do just a little bit of cleanup. Uh, behind the scenes, I've gone ahead and adjusted these uh, cells here a little bit, so they're a little bit bigger and whatnot. Nothing too fancy. Uh, Change some spacing and padding in between these things, but uh, other than that, really nothing crazy. So one thing I want to do though, uh, two things this episode actually, I want to clean up a little bit of these filters here, make them look a little bit better, and then also handle a better loading state because at the moment we kind of lost the idea of that shimmer and um, we obviously want the shimmer and we can talk about how to actually handle loading states uh, via a sealed interface uh, idea here in Kotlin. So first things first here, we're going to go ahead and update this info here so that it's not just lowercase, right? We even see here in the display that the uh, category these elements are a part of is all lowercase and it just, you know, again, is just a product of how the API was set up. Nothing too crazy. Um, we can just quickly modify that and then actually all of this stuff will fall into place here. Because what I realized is our filters here are a direct product of how our products are set up, right? Um, the value here comes from the products category, and at the moment, so does the display text. So because the products category is lowercase, that is why these filters are also lowercase. So let's go ahead and just kind of clean things up at the product level, and it should make our lives a little bit easier. So as we see here in the view model, when we are told to refresh the products, we make the API call to the products repository, uh, right, we're not handling an error, but that's uh, okay. Um, and instead here, we actually go ahead and get all the products from our service. Uh, we nullably cast the body. And then if it is present, we map all of the products into uh, domain products via our product mapper. And if we look here, the product mapper, again, everything all set up with Hilt, really, really nice. Um, we take a network product, we translate it to a regular product. We do a little bit of manipulation here as far as we're setting the scale for the big decimal and whatnot, but right here, the category, the network product category, this is lowercase and this is the culprit here. This is the problem. So there used to be a function here called capitalize, which is really, really nice. It just does exactly what you would want. And instead, uh, it looks like it's deprecated. And as is that one here, if we take a look at the uh, actual usages here, the declaration, it says use replace first car instead. Okay, so clean this up here really quickly, created a function to basically do exactly what uh, was told in that little you know tool tip because it was deprecated. Uh, so we've just wrapped this in a function, we take in a string and then we replace the first character. It's pretty straightforward here. We just check if it is lowercase, then we set that character to title case. Otherwise we just use uh, that character there. So it's a pretty safe bet here. I think once we rerun things, we're gonna see not only an update, a capitalization in the filters, but also on the cards themselves. And if we take a look now, yep, exactly. Uh, we have men's clothing, jewelry, all that kind of stuff is capitalized accordingly, and as are our filters here. So really, really nice stuff. Again, this just sits inside of our product mapper here. Uh, completely abstracted away from the rest of the display logic, all the uh, any of the favoriting, the expansion, any of the sorting, filtering, whatever the case is. Um, so again, just a really, really good example of separation of concerns and how uh, you know this product mapper here really starts to kind of shine a little bit, right? We're able to manipulate something from the back end to get it more in the structure that we want. Um, so aside from this, let's go all the way back. Um, so now we have our product set up properly. And instead, one thing I figured we can do here is in the filters, we could maybe put at the end in parentheses, the number of elements that exist inside of that filter, right? I think that would kind of be cool. feels a little bit more intelligent uh, and just again, shows a little bit of an example of how we can have our display text here differ from the value that we use to filter everything on and just provide a little bit more, uh, you know, substance to our filters, a little bit more intelligence to the entire application. So let's just go ahead and figure that out now. So what we can do here uh, is we can do something, we can make use of the group by feature. And 
right after this, let's discuss what the actual type is here. So if we highlight everything and then control shift P, we now, sorry, we now see that it is a map of string to list of products. And what this ends up doing, you know what, might as well hit a breakpoint because, all right, so we're on this breakpoint here. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy and paste that code that we ran, uh, and then we clicked it here so that we can actually evaluate it. And what this does is, again, it creates a list, oh, sorry, a map of string to list of products. And so for every category here, that's what we're grouping them by. For every category here, it creates a list uh, according to that key basically in our map and then we can go ahead and see inside of men's clothing we can see all the different products that exist for men's clothing and you could do the same thing for women's clothing or any of these other uh, you know entries here in the map which is really really nice and as we can see it says size four four six six so we actually have based upon the size of the list we have how many elements are within that category if that makes sense so uh, we can let that resume here. We're going to go ahead and just uh, kind of get back into things. And so then what we can do here is we can map each one of these. And this is basically going to become our filters here. And uh, so we group them by category and then we map. And as we see here, it's a map entry, right, of string to list of products. And so we basically are just going to take this logic inside here. And instead of category, it's going to be it. Let's rename this actually. So why don't we call this uh, map entry because that's exactly what it is. And so this will be the map entry dot, uh, key. And then here we're going to have uh, a little bit of a string concatenation deal. So it's gonna again be the map entry dot key. And then in parentheses next to it, it's going to have the map entry dot value dot size. Uh, we're going to call our two set there and then we're just going to replace this one with our filters there and we're all done. And as this reboots here we're going to go ahead and see. Perfect. Look at that. All the different categories have their different uh, number associated with them. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We saw it in the debug window. Now we can go ahead and see it up here. Uh, obviously just four elements. So this seems to be working exactly how I wanted it. That is really, really cool. And so I like this change here because we went ahead and kind of updated this a little bit, right? As far as it just makes it a little bit more readable, which is really, really nice. However, we kind of have a lot going on here. Um, you know, even if you were to kind of expand this stuff around, it, you know, we start to chew up some lines, starts to look a little bit um, you know, a little bit more intense. And so I think what we can do here is we can go ahead and actually help ourselves out by delegating this to a different class. Um, this is also kind of the first moment we're starting to think about testing, testability, and specifically unit tests. So I'm gonna go ahead and name this class the filter generator. I've been sitting here for like 10 minutes trying to come up with a proper name here because it's not really a mapper, it's not really a repository, so it's kind of just a generator. I don't really know. Um, we're just going to go ahead and create this as a regular old class. We'll go ahead and annotate the at inject uh, constructor here. Really, really nice. And then we're just going to create a public function. So generate from, this is going to be a products list, which is going to be a list of products and then this is going to return a set of filter right really really nice let's import that and now basically what we're going to do here is we're just going to go ahead and more or less copy all of this information over here and we're just going to say return products list dot perfect and so now we have this logic here elsewhere right and it exists in a public function it's in its own little class the class is injectable via hilt really great and given any product list it's going to go ahead and generate this set of filters based upon our little criteria here um, so this is a little this is pretty helpful because a if we ever wanted to change how we generate our filters from this list of products we just have to modify one little function here um, if we need this function functionality in a handful of different places, we can just add in, uh, we're gonna do that right now, we can just add in this little uh, filter generator. Perfect, we got our little uh, icon over there so that Hilt is doing its thing. This is going to be a set of filter, and then we're gonna say filter generator dot generate from products. Perfect, right? And that's more or less as clean as we can get this right now. 
uh, but that does look pretty nice, right? We have our products, we then go ahead and use those to generate our filters, and then we update our state, right? Bare bones, very clear, very obvious what's going on. We're getting something from a repository, we're generating these things from uh, the, the products here. We can go ahead and click into it and you can see exactly how this is working. And most importantly, we can get into actually testing this, right? We can run this function through a variety of different tests. And as long as we give it a valid list, we can go ahead and assert what comes out of it as far as the set of filters, if it's proper, if it's improper, all that kind of stuff. Really, really, really nifty things. So even though this feels like maybe a redundant or a small change, it will become super valuable when we look to test this. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and do uh, a little bit of that. Test me, wonderful. Um, testing is not the purpose of this episode, but it will be something that we talk about pretty soon. This project is set up pretty well for it, and there's a couple more tweaks that I'll make to make it even more set up for it. And we'll dive into a little bit of unit testing to really make this thing bulletproof, um, even though it's, it's pretty straightforward as is. So I'm gonna pause here. Thank you guys so much for watching. There is still another half of this video, but if you made it this far, I'd really appreciate a like. If you're enjoying the content, if you like my style, please comment, please subscribe if you are brand new so that you don't miss out. And let's go ahead and pop on over to, where are we? Yes. Um, so the idea of this product uh, epoxy controller, we used to have this set data field. We used to have the uh, empty list there when this was just a list of items and that would initialize our controller with something empty and therefore we would show empty state, the loading state, use our shimmer, our Facebook shimmer there, which we don't actually have at the moment. If I just go ahead and comment this out real quick, go back to the view model. If we delay propagating this information for let's say two seconds, the screen is just gonna sit there uh, and there isn't necessarily a loading state that is being presented. As we see it come up, it just sits there for a little bit and then something happens. So a little bit of a poor, obviously we have you know two seconds, but a little bit of a poor user experience. They don't necessarily know what's going on. And so instead we're gonna go ahead and change that. So a simple little message here, updated products that capitalize categories and the filter generator to generate our filters, go ahead and commit it. It's just a good idea to go ahead and commit along the way, kind of save your work, you know, control S, uh, along the way so that you know now we can kind of work with a clean slate and so we can more or less look into just uh, this product list fragment handling the set data and our issue here so so the problem is is that we can't really if we take a look at this UI state the only way to go ahead and generate an, uh, an instance of one of these in a loading instance is creating one that has an empty set for filters and an empty list for products. And while that will work, that's not always the best idea. Instead, we can be a little bit more declarative here. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just cut this information out because we're not gonna need it there. And we're actually gonna transition this. So instead of it being a, uh, a data class, we're gonna create a sealed interface, sorry. And then within here, we're gonna have the different cases, right? So one case here can be success. This actually needs to be a data class. Uh, name success, and this is where our information is gonna be put in. This will uh, extend our product list fragment UI state. And then there will also be, this can just be an object for loading. And uh, that again is going to extend the product list fragment UI state. So the benefit here of using a sealed interface or a sealed class is that all of the elements or all of the objects, the classes, whatever, that actually implement them or extend them are all defined at compile time. They're all defined ahead of time, typically done so inside of the class itself or the interface itself, so that you can go ahead and just see basically the different options. If you're unfamiliar with any of the sealed idea, sealed classes idea in Kotlin, it's basically like the idea of an enum from Java, but you can store a little bit more information about it. You can be a little bit more intelligent and the compiler is also pretty intelligent around there. So now we've gone ahead and uh, you know changed what this actually is. So of course we're gonna have some errors along the way, but what we can do here is we can very easily just say when data, and this is what I meant by the compiler is a little bit more uh, intelligent, is it will actually cast now the uh, the, the data here, which is really just this interface, it can actually cast it as this success object when you're inside of this block here, right? Because then we can have data.products and filters and all that good stuff that's available. 
and then otherwise here we have our loading state and now we can basically understand what the different uh, states are within this fragment UI state and handle something accordingly. So just going to go ahead and copy this and put it in there. This one as well, we're just going to go ahead and copy and we're just going to put it in there. Wonderful. Go ahead and delete all this other stuff. So, so yeah, this is a little, maybe a little more difficult to read, right? We could break this out into particular functions or we can use some other kind of classes and whatnot. I'm not super worried about it right now. Um, this little when is giving us a, uh, a warning here that it's not exhaustive and we're just going to simply throw something unhandled branch We'll print out the data whatever it is at that point But realistically all we care about is the success and the loading case here if we go ahead and bounce out to our uh, Fragment now we do have a little bit of an issue here and it says that there isn't there are no constructors associated with an interface Anytime you create a sealed anything you can't just go ahead and create an instance of this instead You need to create an instance of one of the types that extend it here. Um, so it's a very quick fix here It's just going to be a matter of dot success right there and then in this case, which is pretty nice we can get rid of this to do and then what we can do here is just say our product fragment UI state dot loading wonderful and so now it makes it a little bit nicer to work with we should see uh, um, some kind of shimmer here that we have I don't think we have support the filters it might be because the API is just happening too quickly so we're just gonna go ahead and delay it by one and a half seconds Hmm, okay, so we actually don't have something there. What's going on? Okay, everybody. So I know that was just a few seconds for you, but that was a lot longer for me. Interestingly enough, right, we had this originally set here. Where we were going to say, okay, say loading uh, immediately. Well, once we combine these uh, flows here, we do get an emission here of basically an empty state here right our products are empty our favorite product ids are empty the product filter info is all empty because that's what happens when we attach uh, listeners to the flows in the beginning our store is empty whatever a second and a half goes by we make the api call we store that stuff in the store and then this information actually matters because there's content there so unfortunately uh, we didn't set up anything incorrectly but instead uh, we just need to add a little bit of additional error handling in here so we're just going to go with if the list of products ids is empty that we can return at combine and then that will return the loading state from there and then that will get set on our controller and all should be good so we still have the second and a half delay here let's see if it works properly look at that we have our shimmer yeah a little annoying because we don't have the um shimmer for this carousel all right so i got it to work a little bit here instead of using a previous id we have uh, a random uuid and that will prevent epoxy from basically binding like this uh, and it'll recognize that there's new data above it that needs to be rebound so uh, you know not a hundred percent perfect because obviously the shimmer layout should have this involved in it but for right now I'm not super worried about it I'm happy that this actually uh, works now and you know we can always clean that up later if we really want to but realistically I don't think it's that big of a deal um, yeah other than that I haven't really changed anything else here you know obviously we can break this out into functions to make it look a little bit cleaner and a little bit nicer and not have a hundred lines inside of a controller but uh, that being said here we have accomplished a little bit let me just go ahead and remove this delay here uh, and rerun it to see how it looks uh, in the regular fashion probably not even going to see the shimmer uh, see it for a tiny bit and then it flickers off but uh, we've covered a few things here. We've talked a little bit about setting things up for testing, um, and we can see that here. We've gone ahead and updated these a little bit more, and I've completed so that the snapping doesn't actually affect us. It actually holds its position, um, and everything is good here. So I'm going to cut it here. Thank you guys so much for sticking through it. Uh, let me know how I'm doing in the comments section. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thanks.